We acknowledge that this event is taking place upon the traditional territories, the territories of the Haudenosaunee of the Six Nations Confederacy, the Anishinaabe peoples of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nations, and before them, the Chinantan Nation, called the Neutral by the French and the Attawandaran by the surrounding nations. These people are the original caretakers, the peoples that lived on and intimately worked with these lands. We acknowledge that we have a responsibility to know and understand their heritage. The treaty that was signed for this territory is the Between the Lakes Treaty No. 3 of 1792, and further the deed referred to as the Haldeman Proclamation of 1784, which applies to the land six miles on either side of the Grand River, from the mouth to its source. We need to be aware of our role in these documents. We also recognize the enduring presence of Indigenous peoples upon this land. We acknowledge that we have an obligation to learn to live wisely together on this land. As long as I know you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for this introduction. And I do feel very privileged to speak to this in particular. As a native Grand Floridian, it is an honor to be in a room full of people who just appreciate the history of Grand people too. As I discover more historical examples, as well as present day examples, of the Grand punched above its weight, it just makes me much more, like, very proud um, to, to be part of Brantford, to be sharing the stories, and, you know, hopefully sharing that with both people who live here and didn't know, and all the newcomers that we're seeing more and more these days. Um, so, I'm just very privileged, and thank you for having me. So for tonight, I have been asked to talk about the Mohawk Canal and the lake area, and I will cover these topics here on the screen. The first 20 minutes I'll spend on the history of it, and I, 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 my husband was saying, who are you to talk to, Ruth? I probably already knows a lot of, about this, and so I am no expert, but I am going to attempt to share that history with you. For the last 20 minutes or so, I will give more modern content of which I have been personally involved in, and that provides a behind-the-scenes look at the Brownfield Remediation Program that I helped to lead, as well as the future of, of the Mohawk Lake District trying to revitalize it and bring new life to that area. I will also then discuss the cultural heritage landscape destination, which I thought would probably be quite interest, of an interest to this group. So by the end of my presentation, just to put a little context around this, what I was trying to achieve, I've been working on this for a little while, my main message for this presentation is to convey the holistic picture of how the creation of Mohawk Canal really set the course of history for Brantford. It introduced many firsts and impressive achievements for our city, but it also did set an unfortunate precedent for our relationship with our Indigenous neighbours. Um, and I think that's a critical to appreciate. So with commemorating the good, it is even more important to acknowledge and raise awareness that this story does have many perspectives. Of all places in Brantford, this neighborhood, this location particularly, has so many layers to it because Six Nations did in, indeed establish their village here. So my presentation will peel back those layers, hence why I called it the Layers on a Map. And I also wanted to sort of put my own thesis out there that you know, like Wayne Gretzky made Brantford famous internationally, or Alexander Graham Bell is part of you know, Brantford's historical legacy, I, I think Mohawk Lake and Mohawk Canal, with all the history that's here, um, is also contributing to Brantford's unique identity. And I hope Brantford can be known for this district as it is known for its hockey stars and its inventors. So that's, that's the thesis I'm going to put out there. Like I say, I'm not uh, the historical expert in this area, so I did rely very heavily on the Brand Historical Society's own published works, which included the Brand River, Brand River Navigation Company by Bruce Emerson Hill. And I was hoping to see Bruce here tonight, but perhaps with the, the change in date, he wasn't able to make it. And also the writings of Ruth Leffler. So thank you to those experts. And then I will also rely on the work completed by the archaeological firm ASI, who in 2020 completed the technical studies that recommended to council that Mohawk Lake, Mohawk Canal, merited a cultural heritage landscape designation. 
their work, ASI in particular, um, all of these works were very comprehensive, and so any relevant maps or, or photographs that I show, I encourage you to go to these sources to see where the primary sources are. <clears throat> so let's start here on this modern day Google map. The Mohawk Canal um, was the foundation for this area and, and what the city now refers to as the Mohawk Lake District. So it includes the Mohawk Canal, um, Shallow Creek Park around it. I can probably use a pointer. Shallow Creek Park and then, then former industrial properties, Mohawk, Mohawk Park, and then it goes all the way to where the canal meets the Grand River. This area is approximately two kilometers. Now this map is very functional, probably gave people a lot of directions, um, but it doesn't indicate just how rich the history he is here. So it makes me think of all the people who see a map like this and just have no idea just how much history is in this area, and perhaps tells the story of how Brantford formed and evolved the way it did, with its transportation routes, the industrial beginnings, recreational history, and of course the indigenous history. So on a modern day map, we can see the interesting collection of things here. This doesn't tell you the full story. So the history must begin before colonial settlement. There is wide archaeological evidence that the Grand River Valley area within, was within the historical territory of indigenous peoples between 11,000 and 10,000 years BC. Whether the indigenous tribes just traveled through here as hunting bands or evolved to creating small villages characterized by longhouses within palisaded compounds. It was first the Iroquoian speaking Atawandaran, known as the neutral people, who ASI reports was one of the earliest indigenous people <coughs> who lived in the Grand River Valley area before 1600s. There were as many as 20,000 neutral people in this area as late as 1640. Now, the Six Nations who are here today were then living in now New York State. And it was only 130 years later, in 1784, that Captain Joseph Brandt and the Six Nations left New York State for Canada. They were awarded land, as we heard in the acknowledgement, to acknowledge their loyalty to the British Crown and to compensate for their land losses during the American Revolution. So the land was purchased by the British Crown and out, um, from the Mississaugas of the Credit in 1784 and at a, a much larger area, approximately 550,000 500, 550, acres, six miles deep on either side of the Grand River, the Haldeman Track was set aside for the Six Nations. Captain Joseph Brand created the Mohawk Village that you see depicted here in this watercolor by Elizabeth Sinko. And really, honestly, when I see this photo and you know dig a little bit, it's just I really hope that my kids who are entering the school system get this very amazing and very local history added to their curriculum. You know, I remember learning about the Karadwa in grade seven, and there was no local context at all. But how much more interesting it would have been knowing it was happening right outside our doorstep. <clears throat> so I'm now going to transition to how the Mohawk Canal came to be. On this map from 1830, you can see our consultants transpose the Mohawk Lake District on top, so you can recognize the present day uh, Mohawk Park here. And the Mohawk Canal isn't built yet in 1830. This is a much later map in 1858 showing the canal and Mohawk Lake. So the main purpose of the canal was to bypass the 12 mile meanderings of the Grand River. <clears throat> which uh, you can see. The folks today, you know, who who are been lately taking, you know, floaties out to the Grand River love this oxbow, right? Can give them a two hour plus lazy river journey with only a one kilometer dis uh, difference between where they can start and where they can finish and it's, it's enjoyable. I haven't done it yet, but it looks very interesting. <laughs> um, but for the growing industries, you know, in the 1800s, building a canal system would greatly speed up transportation of goods if they didn't have to meander like that. Now, people commonly mischaracterize Mohawk Lake, which formed later on as a turning basin for boats using the canal. And I once did that too, but Bruce Hill was quick to correct me years ago. 
the churning basin for boats using the canal was actually closer to downtown, approximately where Shallow Creek Park now sits. So Mohawk Lake is in fact just a happy byproduct of the lake. And what happened was once the canal was built, it rose the water levels of the swamp that was in that area and formed a pond, and then, which was called Lovejoy's Pond, and then later it became larger and was known as Mohawk Lake. And since we have this map up, the lands within Mohawk Park, as we noted before, are, would eventually form under the lands of Lovejoy's estate there. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So Bruce's, Bruce Hill's book is a fascinating read on the Grand River Navigation Company, which built the canal, then known as the Brantford Cut. My summary is going to be quite shallow in comparison to his very interesting book. Now, when presenting the timeline of the company's history, I, I thought these arrows rightly affected sort of the dramatic rise and then <laughs> the dramatic fall of this company. So the, the company began in 1827 when a meeting was called to form the Grand River Navigation Company. As reported in Bruce Hill's book, the completion of the Welland Canal in the Niagara region in the 1820s, so the Welland Canal, um, was, it found that in order to ensure an adequate water supply for their locks, a feed line from the Grand River, I'm sorry, actually further up, feed line from the Grand River to Chippewas Creek was needed to supply water to Welland River, and then that would the Welland Canal. Therefore, the Welland Canal and the Grand River projects were very early connected, and for promoters of the Grand River project, they considered building the Grand River Canal essential to the continued success of the Welland Canal. In 1832, the company was received its provincial charter and incorporated, and following that, the construction of eight locks and dams began. Five of them were built in 1836, and the remaining three locks were, and cutting the canal three miles from Brantford began in 1843. By 1848, the Brantford Canal was officially opened by the company, making the Grand River nav navigable from a distance, for a distance of about 60 miles from Brantford to Dunville. But the company didn't last long, and by 1859, the company foreclosed and ownership transferred to the city of Brantford in 1861. Some reasons for the downfall of the company, its declining revenues did not keep pace with soaring costs or repairs. By 1850s, there was also rail fever and railways were being built. Investors were turning their monies over in that direction. And also the context of the time was there was a, just a depressed state of business. There was a couple of bad crop seasons, no demand for sawed lumber that would pay rent to the canal and the company found it quite difficult to collect the revenues it needed. Lastly, as reported by Bruce, Bruce's book, the company had always to be struggled to be sufficiently and honorably financed. An important theme that Bruce illustrates is that the Six Nations funding for this project was significant, both in value, but also in the manner that it happened. In the concluding chapter of his book, he writes, until 1851, the navigation company had been built primarily at the Six Nations' expense. Their funds and lands had been appropriated, and more of their land had to be sold in order to maintain the payments on the loan installments. The opening up of the Grand River Valley by the navigation company ironically repaid the Six Nations only an increased number of squatters that settled on their lands. He also writes that the Six, he also provides insight that the Six Nations funds were placed in the Grand River Navigation Company without their advice or consent. And at one time, based on financial contributions, they, the Six Nations owned three quarters of the company. To explain how it came to be that they owned so much of the company without their knowledge, I read the following excerpt from Bruce's book. Officially, the control of Six Nations funds was in the hands of three trustees nominated by the Six Nations Council and appointed by the lieutenant governor. The lieutenant governor controlled the funds and the trustees were largely kept in the dark. How the Indian funds were invested in the Grand River scheme is now partially clear. The receiver general was responsible for the management of the Indian funds who was John H. Dunn from 1820 to 1844. Dunn was an active promoter and director of the Welland Canal 
and a close friend and business acquaintance of William Merritt, one of the most ardent supporters of the Grand River Project. So I found this part of the history fascinating because it informs the nature of the disconnected and troubled relationship between Six Nations and the city of Brantford and between Six Nations and government in general. Therefore, this area, rich in such a history, interesting history, does have a dark side as well that we cannot overlook. <clears throat> so despite the, co the collapse of the Grand River Navigation Company, historical photos show the canal is still a lovely landscape. And the canal sparked another in, uh, entrepreneurial endeavor, this time by Alfred Watts, who put Brantford on the map to become one of the first towns in Ontario to have electricity in our downtown. So drawing upon ASI's work, I will tell you a bit about Alfred Watts and the hydro generating station he built. In 1875, the Mohawk Canal rights were sold to Alfred Watts, who used the locks as a dam to utilize the 33-foot difference in level between the river and the canal. Entrepreneurs advocated for a pole line to light the main streets and the stores, and the Brantford Electric Company was then established in 1890. By 1905, the power plant had a water capacity of 1,200 horsepower and was supplying many of the Brantford's largest industries. But this company also didn't last long. In, in 1908, Brantford linked its electrical network with the Dominion power system, and hydroelectric power was actually then coming from DeSue Falls, 52 miles away. And this newly transmitted power was found to be so cheap and reliable that the powerhouse at the locks did end up closing in 1911. Um, it wasn't kept up to date, and then after a flood in 1927, the locks became ruins. Um, but those ruins are still standing today, which is... So it was very difficult, actually, to find photographs, historical photographs, of, of Alfred Watts Hydro Generating Station. Um, so that's the only photograph I could find in 1919. Um, and then the photograph on the other side is what the ruins look like. <coughs> <coughs> and now, on to the creation of Mohawk Park, and I will rely both on the work of Ruth Lickler as well as the technical reports by ASI. So like the creation of Mohawk Lake, I found it interesting that Mohawk Park was also sort of a byproduct of the industrial endeavors happening in the area. Firstly, as I noted before, the park was created on Lovejoy's, John Lovejoy's land. Town records from 1832 show that Lovejoy acquired the eastern and northern portion of Mohawk Village. The earlier 1830s map that I showed earlier did not have his name on it, but by 1832 the land was labeled as his. Now in ASI's work, the archaeological firm, the word acquired is in quotes and sourced to a Six Nations historian, Jim Wendell, who theorized that not all land transfers were legitimate. Wendell in 2018 wrote an article that suggested Lovejoy opportunistically benefited from gifts of land that were made legal by the government at the time, who might have mischaracterized the land transfers when speaking to the Mohawks, then under the leadership of Joseph Grant's son. In 1836, a crown deed for the land was created. Now, I wanted to add another bit of context to this that just doesn't paint the Mohawks as unknowingly outwitted. They were indeed often taken advantage of, but I think they did try to play the game with their, their counterparts. Perhaps the cards were always a little bit stacked against them, um, but it would appear that the Mohawks tried. And where I get that assessment from, again, is from Bruce Hill's book, it does, well, a, a, an excerpt that I, I don't read often. So Bruce Hill writes that Chief Joseph Brandt's generous land giving can also be characterized as a wily approach. So I read, um, the wily Mohawk Joseph Brandt uh, claimed that Six Nations was not yet accustomed to farming and hunting was not adequate on Grand River lands. By sale of lands, an annuity would be provided that would perpetually augment the income of the Indian people. <coughs> Brand foresaw that newcomers would construct saw and grist mills that would increase the value of the Indian property. But the failure of the Six Nation councils of chiefs to recognize many of Brand's sales and the ever-present problem of land squatters complicated the problem of ownership. Only some of the sales were confirmed by mortgage. So again, I just wanted to you know, put it out there that <coughs> suggests that there was some strategy as, um, on the part of the Mohawks. 
Um, and I did find that fascinating, and it adds some nuance to it. Um, so it does also suggest why it's so difficult to clarify land title. <coughs> So back to the creation of Mohawk Park, which the land now seemed to be firmly in Lovejoy's name. In 1894, a railway company leased Lovejoy's land and built a rail line from the city limits to a small station within the area of the park. And this allowed open street cars capable of carrying 90 passengers to and from this location for just five cents a ride. And Ruth Leffler reports that it was deemed a very pleasant ride. And so the manager of the railway subsequently oversaw the preparations to create Mohawk Park as a formal destination. It was reported that from a high bank, one could view the surrounding farm and the land, the Mohawk Chapel. And I wonder if that's why the name of Mohawk Park was eventually settled on, instead of Grant Park, which uh, Ruth reports had been considered as well. So you can, you can see here that rail trolley. <clears throat> on May 24, 1895, the grand opening of the 55-acre 50 acre Mohawk Park took place. In those early days, uh, Ruth writes that the park was well known for Ontario as a great place to have picnics. Um, there was also a cinder bicycle track, reportedly the first of its kind in Ontario. And when bicycles in general reached the height of their popularity, Brimford was known as an important Canadian bicycle city. I did not know. The, uh, the track at Mohawk Park was the scene of many meets during the 1920s, as reported by the book City Parks of Canada, um, which I got at the local library by Linda Martin and Carrie Segura. By 1915, the city of Brimford purchased the park from the Lovejoy estate, and it remains a popular city park today. <clears throat> so I keep showing the outline of the lands involved in this area. And a piece of the puzzle that I haven't talked about yet, of course, is the location of the former factories that also form a significant part of Brantford's unique identity and heritage. Besides showing some of my favorite historic photos of the companies operating in their heyday, I am going to unfortunately completely gloss over the origin stories of those factories and instead talk about the project that uh, the city completed to rectify, unfortunately, the environmental legacy that left the properties contaminated as brownfield sites. That remediation project, reportedly the largest in Ontario to date in terms of amount of contamination, to me is, an also, is also an interesting Brantford story. A story that I've been invited to share at conferences, including at Mont in Montreal, Toronto, and Winnipeg. Um, it is more recent history, but it has put Brantford on the map, so to speak. <coughs> So these are my favorite photos of, um, of the factories in their heyday, and it gives you a sense of how to appreciate just how significant the remediation project was. Um, so the factories uh, that used to be here were at the properties of 347 Greenwich Street, 22 Mohawk Street, 66 <coughs> Mo Mohawk Street, included several, uh, Verity, Adams Wagon Company, Cockshut, Massey Harris, Massey Ferguson, all those companies. The evolution of these factories was also very much tied to the canal, which provided transportation and shipping, but also a water source and hydroelectric power. At the height of these industries, these factories employed tens of thousands of people, when Brantford's population was only 80,000. But by the late 1980s, these historical buildings weren't economical any further, and the companies moved to modern structures, and or the companies themselves ceased to operate. Much of the pollution in the lake and the canal is the result of the indiscriminate dumping of waste materials from these factories. And that's where I enter the story personally as the person, the staff person who led the, the remediation. That's me, little me, in front, <laughs> and the team of experts who completed the remediation program that took place between 2014 and 2016. But the journey to even getting trucks on the site took 10 years before that. So let's go there. <clears throat> the city acquired the properties in the early 2000s through failed tax sales. When the city first took ownership, many of you will recall that there were still buildings on the properties. The city was also negotiating with a developer who showed interest in completing both the remediation and the restoration of some of the buildings as part of an idea of creating a large 
uh, mixed commercial residential development. The city you know, negotiated with this particular company for three years. In the end, they were not very reputable, and they did go bankrupt. And so the city cut ties. By 2012, the city decided to pursue the remediation component itself and to see if once remediated, it could attract private sector partners. Even though the city explored remediation options that could take place while the buildings remain, and that would have actually been the steam cleaning that Ms. Sherry mentioned, it was a, that was trickier and riskier and may not have achieved the necessary standards we needed to achieve, and so the city made the tough decision to demolish all the buildings. It was a painful day, and I, I was there. <coughs> And that decision was informed by the confirmed level of contamination. It covered about 75% of the sites, so that's the green areas, almost under almost all the buildings, and it was a lot of contamination. A remediation program of the existing buildings was possible, but it wasn't going to be easy, and time continued to tick. Another important factor was that the city received $12 million from the federal government towards the remediation program. That itself was a new, unique accomplishment achieved in large part by a former councillor, Marguerite Chesky Smith. And I, I always think about this great photograph of the former councillor who took then Prime Minister Paul Martin on a tour of these buildings. I think it was around 2004. And if you know Marguerite, you know that she's tenacious. And in the photos, you can see Mr. Martin with his fingers like kind of clenched like this. <laughs> And you can just see that he's really quite fatigued and ready to get out. Well, whatever she said to him that day, it worked her magic because shortly after that visit, the federal government gave the city $12 million. And the province added $5 million, agreeing with Marguerite's argument that these industries <coughs> contributed to the country, all of Canada's economic wealth, and that Brantford alone shouldn't bear the cost of remediating. So with federal and provincial dollars, the city had to achieve a December 2016 deadline to complete the project. And keeping the buildings was also not going to meet that deadline. <clears throat> so the city launched into a remediation program with expert technical guidance from a team that has completed thousands of remediation programs across Canada. And they confirmed that in their experience in the industry, Bramford's project was the most contaminated the biggest project in Ontario, maybe even Canada. The main contaminants on the site were oil, lots and lots of it. Heavy, as well as heavy metals, lead paints, degreasers, and underground fuel tanks storing these project products. For the oil, it was, a, it was a heavy bunker fuel crude oil. It wasn't like thin and processed, but it was quite pure, and you could tell because it was actually thick like molasses. So how did the city remediate, remediate that? Oil recovery ended up being quite uh, common and featured prominently in our program. The oil could actually be skimmed off the water and recycled. It could also be washed off a lot of the rock material. So what we found was a lot of river stone in this area, natural river stone. And it had a little sheen on it and we ran those rocks through this conveyor belt that shot water out and the, walk, the rocks were literally washed um, and could actually be reused and back built onto the site. <clears throat> Lastly, oil is a natural product that can be broken down um, and, and disintegrated. So for the oil soaked sand and dirt, we introduced microorganisms that eat and digest carbon, which oil is made of. And they were introduced into dirt and piled up and mixed regularly, kind of like composting. And there's a technical term for it though, bioremediation. And that also meant a lot of the soil was sustainably remediated and reused on the site instead of having to take it away and find new soil. <clears throat> so the next series of pictures will show just the progress we made over time. This is in 2015. Then Mayor Friel of Bramford took a helicopter tour of Canada, uh, of the city on Canada Day, and that was when this was just starting. Then uh, this interim photo was taken by a drone, so you start to see some progress, less piles, 
And then once again, the mayor went up in a helicopter in 2016 as the remediation <laughs> program was wrapping up. So you know, a lot of that exposed material is now um, remediated and put back. <clears throat> once again, the site is 50 acres, so it is a really big undertaking. Uh, just a sample of the photographs just to show the intensity of the equipment and you can also start to sort of see, sort of see the difference between the oil that was not the oil and then further up ahead it was actually skimmed. So just that difference there. In the end, this remediation project was quite unique in Ontario and as I said we were invited to a share experience with several other municipalities. Our accomplishments included some innovative remediation techniques, including that skimming, which 120,000 liters was actually taken out, um, which is about the size of one and a half backyard swimming pools. We also excavated a lot of contaminated soil, which is, which is about the equivalent of 14 NFL football fields. Um, but we didn't actually need to simply dispose of it. About three quarters of the soil was treated on site. And that was a huge benefit to the neighborhood, as well as costs, uh, because it prevented 5,000 truckloads of material leaving and coming from the site. The last unique thing about the project was the ogre problem and how we handled it. Um, raise, a, raise your hand, anyone live near Eagle Place? Okay. So you smelt it. <laughs> yes, so perhaps you smelt it when we exposed that bunker fuel. It was a horrendous smell. I, I can almost still smell it. And unfortunately, it caused a lot of people to have headaches, sore throats, watery eyes, and even when the hot, hot summer heat was um, a factor, it makes it difficult for some people to even breathe. So we ended up pausing the project for four months so we could come up with a solution. And we knew it wasn't good enough to just keep going and asking people to live through that. But it was also important and necessary that the contamination couldn't stay either. So how we dealt with that could take another full presentation. I will say that the cooperation and the collaboration that I experienced with communities, with individuals, was really inspiring for me personally and showed me the importance of opening yourself up to dialogue and even conflict. Out of the conflict, a better solution was created. Um, sorry. And it wouldn't have happened if the city and the remediation team just hid ourselves away and avoided that criticism. I spoke at a conference when an audience member said he was surprised that we held a public meeting and just allowed people to like yell at us, basically. <laughs> and every phone call and email I, I had where people yelled and complained, I phoned them back. And I even visited their houses if they let me. <laughs> and I found that if I was willing to listen, I would hear perspective or an idea that would help inform a solution. So it wasn't really rocket science, but in retrospect, I can see how much courage it took to you know, take that. But it really did pay off because we came up with a new solution, we kept going, and the community has since come on board. I would get people actually phoning me to say, I guess I do smell it, you can come by here, I think you can smell it too, and then I would shut things down for that day, and then we'd try again. So then they came on board and really wanted this project to happen, to, to be successful. <clears throat> so the project is not over yet. Now it's time to take this story all the way to today and tell you about the city's work to bring the canal, the, the former brownfields, Mohawk Park and Lake back to Lake. Cleaning up the former brownfields was always motivated by the recognition that these properties could achieve a much greater purpose um, and so we started to establish a program and we called it the Mohawk Lake District but in retrospect now I wish I called it the Mohawk Canal District because to me the canal is actually way more important but most people do know the lake and where it is so that that name stuck <laughs> after speaking to over a thousand people in the community about what they wanted for this area this vision on the screen was developed. And now having just spoken about the hundred years of history and the significance of this history to why Brantford is the way it is, I find this vision even more important. And towards the end you'll see this is a place where we honor the past but also be inspired for the future. 
This is a place where history, culture, recreation, and tourism meet. You know, as it always has throughout time. The path to achieve this is far from easy, but isn't the saying anything worth having doesn't come easy? So we plow on. <clears throat> the new district, these are some images, would create places to shop and eat and um, gather. Museums and other cultural attractions would be here to explore paths and civic spaces to um, enjoy with your friends and family. It would bring new life and activity to the canal and invite people to now enjoy it versus you know, in the past where we heard everyone, parents telling them, don't you dare go in that lake, don't you dare go to the canal, <laughs> no swimming. <laughs> the plan recommends a wide promenade and possibly a sort of boardwalk feature along the canal. It's recommended that people could bike a circuit from Mohawk Park down the towpath along the north side of the canal and around to the south bank of the canal to an improved, we hope to, the plan considers improving the south bank of Mohawk Lake, where people fish right now. There's so much potential here to enhance the recreational activities, cultural activities, and overall tourism. <clears throat> this is an artist's drawing of the aerial view to show just how very large the property, um, how this very large property could be transformed. It's landscaping, new buildings, and really starts to paint a picture. I'll just speak briefly about those potential community partners because it is very exciting if it works out. So that includes the Lansdowne Children's Centre, a facility that provides educational and health-based supports for children with special needs, and the Dejois de Desmai Operational Health Centre, which provides traditional medicine options for both Native and non-Native clients. Both would build new modern facilities that could provide spaces to the community, such as meeting rooms or green spaces. And the Canadian Industrial Heritage Centre also has a proposal and already a lease to construct a new centre honouring honoring the industrial heritage on the site. And so there's the proposal at the bottom. These uses would help act as an anchor to bring everyday activity to the site. The community organisations are quite keen to make it happen. But there are detailed requirements for both organizations and the city that will determine if it's ultimately feasible. So we're both working through it, we just have to get through some discussions. So for those of you who are interested in even more details, you can search Mohawk Lake District on the city's website to see additional information and staff reports to explain all of this in more detail. The last thing to touch upon is a recommendation that the city designate this area as a cultural heritage landscape. So this was Council's direction in 2016 after a study was completed about what could be done to address the upper lots. Hydro generating station area, which was a resource that actually had been previously identified when the city undertook the waterfront master plan. The result was that we needed to do a feasibility study to examine whether the Mohawk Canal and Alfred Watts Hydro Drain Station merited a cultural heritage landscape designation. And to determine if that was merited, the consultants evaluated whether features, the features in this area exhibited cultural heritage value or interest, community value, and historical integrity. To be significant, to be a significant cultural heritage landscape, the Mohawk Canal needed to meet all three criteria. And indeed, yes, it did. <clears throat> In general, cultural heritage landscapes are a little less common and less talked about than the typical designation that you would apply to your home or a property. It is defined as a geographical area of historical significance, which may have been modified by human activities, and is identified as having cultural heritage value or interest by a community. For the city of Brantford, the consultant evaluated the Mohawk Canal CHL through a process that included some background research, fieldwork, evaluation of boundary criteria, and used these UNESCO categories um, of a CHL uh, to determine if it was clearly defined landscape, is it organically evolving, and is it associated cultural landscape there. Sorry, I'm just going to get into the weeds here. Following this, ASI concluded that Mohawk Canal in, is an evolved landscape. This landscape is a result of an initial economic imperative, the construction of the canal, followed by the construction of the hydro generating station, 
and has developed its present form more of a recreational landscape by association with and in response to its natural environment. It is a continuing landscape which retains an active social role in Brantford today while still exhibiting significant material evidence of its evolution over time. I just like that idea that it's, it's not, it hasn't stopped evolving, that it's part of the fabric of the Brantford community and there's still a chance for handprints and footprints to make changes for the better. So that's why I put that up there. <clears throat> All of this is to say that the heritage experts also confirm just how important, how important Mohawk Canal in this area is to Brantford's heritage. And what do we do as a result? Well, there's a big long list of recommended um, recommendations. <coughs> Council has ultimately approved and directed staff that we will designate the Mohawk Canal and Alfred Watts Hydro Generating Station as a cultural and heritage landscape within the city's official plan. And then through that, we would establish policies such as those recommended here. I will highlight a few that improvements to parks and trails and infrastructure are guided by policies to protect heritage value, attributes, and integrity. And to support that, we would require a heritage assessment to be done for any proposed works, including even city projects. We would want the policy, uh, we would want policy to support awareness and appreciation through public education. Hopefully, partners are involved, and those can take the form of signs, plaques, streets, trail names, pond names, and through, <laughs> and through other various means. And overall, myself and other staff strongly believe in collaborating with community organizations such as Grant Historical Society, and especially it will also be key to collaborate with our indigenous neighbors. This will be an important part of Truth and Reconciliation. <clears throat> So I conclude here. Time to conclude. The Mohawk Canal is an integral part of Brantford's story and history. Though it isn't a resounding success story in itself, it still provided transportation of goods and people, and in turn facilitated the growth of industries before railroads. Following that, the hydro generating station on the canal provided electricity to those same factories. Mohawk Lake was a byproduct of the canal, and along with Mohawk Park, these places featured prominently in the recreational history of the city. In the 1900s, this area was a hub of recreational enjoyment for generations of people. ASI writes in their reports that Mohawk Canal is historically linked to its surroundings. In particular, it integrates elements of 19th century canal construction, early hydro generating landscapes, 19th century industrial landscapes, and recreational landscapes all producing a distinct identity representing layers of use, alteration, and growth. And it offered that the layers, these layers and the interplay of these layers are unique and aren't readily seen in a lot of places. The longer I work on this project, it's been 12, 13 years now, the more entrenched and passionate I become to achieve the vision of the Mohawk Lake District to bring this area back to life. Former Councilor Marjorie Chesky Smith made it her decision, her sorry, her mission to get the attention and money to address the brownfield sites. Mary Walsh, some of you know, long advocated for investment and to bring attention and restoration to Upper Watts Hydro Generating Station. These strong and capable ladies are sort of role model, models to me, and I'm realizing that my own heart tells me that I need to see this. Mohawk Lake, Mohawk Canal District through and do what I can to bring it closer to what than just a brown, brown space right now. <laughs>